You're watching the Daily Decrypt, where we may not know much, but we do know currency competition when we see it. I am your host, Amanda B. Johnson, and today's episode is brought to you by Black Halo Bit Halo. Today I've spoken with Daniel Diaz, business developer at Dash, about a reprioritization of resources within the Dash network. After going to different conferences, um, talking to a lot of people from the crypto community in general, we came to the conclusion um, that there's an important need for um, fiat gateways for projects like ours, um, like Dash, which is an alternative network to Bitcoin. And um, first define for us, what's a, what's a fiat gateway? What does that mean? Well, it's just, it's just a way for people to transition from uh, fiat currencies like the dollar into cryptocurrencies like Dash. And there are many exchanges uh, for Bitcoin that are well known, like Kraken, Bitstamp, and so on and so forth. Um, that support this sort of uh, transactions. And then there's also other sort of services like brokers. Um, good examples are uh, Shapeshift, for example, it's a broker, although they don't deal with um, dollars, um, but a broker would just broker a transaction for you, but they're not an exchange per se. And, you know, so you have, you also have like payment gateways like BitPay, um, that are going to facilitate merchants taking cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And um, so those are, I think, um, different sorts of fiat gateways that allows for people to uh, interact, let's say, interact with the traditional uh, fiat economy and, you know, at the same time work with cryptocurrency or moving and out of cryptocurrency or into fiat. Well, um, you are so, so right that... Um I think, yeah, there really are only a bevy of fiat gateways for Bitcoin only. Because just the other day, someone came up and asked me like, hey, Amanda, like, how do I buy such and such, and such a coin that I just heard of, by the way? I guess they thought that I was a go-to for that. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, maybe I am. But <laughs> I just, you know, that's happened before. That's happened multiple times. And every time I've found myself saying like, you just really just have to buy Bitcoin first. Like Bitcoin is the only way really to access any of these other cryptos in any sort of easy way. So you're saying you were getting that at conferences as well? Well, not only at conferences, um, but yes, it's a reality of the market. It's a need we've been feeling. Um, it's a feedback we've been getting from users to people trying to buy Dash. And, um, and also it's a necessary layer. Uh, we see this exchange infrastructure, this fiat gateways as part of public infrastructure is a basic part of the cryptocurrency project. Not being included in this major uh, Bitcoin exchanges is a, is a form of a sanction. It's like, a, it's like an economic sanction because you're cut out from the economy. So even if people wanted or needed Dash, they couldn't get it because we have no bridges, right? The bridges are controlled by specific companies that may or may not be willing to um, help younger uh, projects like Dash through their growth phase. Because, you know, we're caught in a sort of catch-22 situation. These businesses are for profit. Uh, at the time, maybe our volumes or market cap are not as attractive uh, to the large um, exchanges or to institutional investors, okay, but we're already uh, included in most uh, or all major altcoin exchanges currently, right? So there's a gap. Um, so any cryptocurrency network that wants to be independent from Bitcoin and wants to have a very useful network, a different choice, an alternative, needs to uh, be able to build its own infrastructure that's independent from Bitcoin that's going to that's gonna help it actually build um, access to the network that do not go through Bitcoin and grow on its own independently from Bitcoin. So, so you're um, saying you're not going to go begging at the door of Kraken or Bitstamp or whatever and be like, hey, you should totally add Dash as like a fiat thing you're saying that Dash is just going to build its own versions of Kraken and Bitstamp and just, just do its own thing. No, no, no asking or around. Well, 
I think it's more like both. Uh, we have definitely been asking around, and what we've found is that, like I said, there is this gap as to the market cap or uh, volumes in which some of these bigger companies are interested or willing to collaborate and okay. help help uh, a younger cryptocurrency through their growth phase, right? So you're and saying you've been in the catch-22 phase where you want to be attractive enough to big exchanges to be listed, right. but the only way to be attract the only way to be big enough to be attractive is to have been listed on an exchange in the first place. Right. So, um, so we believe we're, we're doing both. Uh, and this is the interesting um, aspect of this project. Uh, if you wanted to build some sort of Dash service tomorrow, what you're going to need is you're going to need tools. You're going to need backend tools um, to uh, build your business on. Basically, you're going to need a wallet. Depending on what it is that you're building, you may need bots that do brokerage, or you may need um, a matching engine that helps for exchanges. These are all like software tools, right? And typically, these software tools are proprietary, are closed source, and belong to the businesses that are offering these services. So as part of this project that we're doing now, we're, we're creating all these tools, or we're funding development for all these tools, and they're going to be fully open source, right? So they have, they have a double purpose. They're going to help uh, create um, specific you know, services or integrations with partners that have already been negotiated, meaning we're going to have concrete, immediate results um, from the project. But also, all of these tools, the multi-sig wallet with client-side key storage, the broker service, the exchange matching engine, all these tools are going to be public, right? So that anyone that wants to build a Dash service or anyone that already has some sort of crypto business and wants to look at a working implementation of Dash to add to his exchange or to fork, um, they can do it, right? So this public infrastructure is going to be available for everyone. And, and that's, I think, one of the most um, interesting things about Dash is, is that it is uh, self-governed and self-funded. I would say that that's probably our biggest advantage. And we can bootstrap um, the project by investing and creating these things instead of sitting and waiting that some company is going to come save us as they may never come so so we're we're going to do we're going to do both we're okay. building all the tools and actually at the same time we're approaching people and looking for partnerships and you know so right. it's it's just about creating a dual strategy is the creation of fiat gateways simply on Dash's wish list, or is this machine already in motion? We're working with Beginner for development. Um, this is Ira Miller's company. Um, they've already worked with us in the past. They recently uh, launched on the first Dash uh, Bitcoin dual ATM, and I the actually the Lava machine. That's right. Right. Yeah, and it's working, and a prototype is working already. Um, so we have a first um, Dash ATM that's already um, working in the wild. It's the first of many, we hope. And so we have a, a good track record, and they build, they've been building uh, crypto tools and services since 2011. So we felt uh, very comfortable with, with the relationship and what we've done so far. So, um, so we're partnering with them, um, and they're going to be building the actual software tools, which is like multi-sig wallet, uh, co-signing service, uh, bid ask exchange, uh, broker service, etc. So all these tools, they're in the announcement, um, and you can, um, you can read it and see the details, but all these tools are going to, like I said, be available for anyone that wants to build a Dash service, but they're also going to be used to integrate immediately with the partners that we're working with. So um, that's the, the first, um, um, let's say, partner that's important to the project. Okay. And then um, for Fiat, we're going to initially be working with um, a company called Crypto Capital. Um, their website is cryptocapital.co. Uh, Crypto Capital is a fully licensed money transmitter you know, financial institution um, out of Panama, okay? 
And the cool thing about them is that it allows for a greater level of independence uh, for the users. Uh, because traditionally, when you're going to fund an exchange, you're going to wire money to the exchange, right? You're going to send them a wire from your bank account to the exchange, and they're going to receive your money. So your money is out of, the, uh, out of your control immediately. In the case of crypto, crypto capital, um, users go through the, um, their KYC process. Uh, it's very straightforward. And then they're going to create their own segregated private account with crypto capital, which is a fully licensed uh, financial institution, meaning if I were to fund an, an exchange transaction, right, I will send the money to myself. So I will send money to my account in crypto capital. So I will be wiring money to Daniel, right? And when the money gets there, it's still in my control. It's not in the control of a third party. And then from there, uh, I can instantly fund the exchanges and I can instantly, um, you know, do or trade and that get my money back to my account and then wire it out or uh, create or take a debit card or anything like that. Okay, so, so uh, explain to me, okay. So I'm mm -hmm. think, when I'm thinking like wiring money to an exchange, I'm thinking something like a la Coinbase, where as you said, I do the, I submit state papers to Coinbase and then I send a bank transfer to them my money sits there until I buy, in the case of Coinbase, Bitcoins. Now, right. so it sounds like a similar process with crypto capital, but you say that the crypto capital would not have control over, say, like the dollars or like the pesos or whatever that I deposited there before I bought Dash? No, in, in, the, fiat, in the fiat world, okay, in the fiat world, there is... There is not the same sort of trustless relationship that exists in the crypto world. In the fiat world, you're always depositing with some institution, right? Mm -hmm. With yeah. some bank. In this, in this case, the bank, let's call them the bank, it's mm -hmm. uh, crypto capital. The mm -hmm. difference is that crypto capital is a crypto friendly bank. And the difference with banks is that they're regulated and you have certain assurances um, because they're a fully compliant financial institution. The only difference is that they are a crypto friendly bank. So they, okay. they, they were specifically created to service different uh, crypto businesses around the world and handle the fiat and the uh, KYC and compliance part of things so that we can ab abstract ourselves from um, the KYC and compliance stuff and not have to deal directly with, with that sort of thing. So that's okay. the sort of service they provide. I'm seeing they the benefit here because as a as a as an outwardly crypto friendly bank, crypto capital, I can see how that would solve the problems I've heard that some people have where say some people who use like Bank of America or Wells Fargo or um, whatever accounts, obviously I'm saying only American banks, it's because I don't I'm not familiar with non American banks. But right. like I've seen so many reports online where people say something like, oh, like Bank of America just shut down my account because they said I'm buying Bitcoins with it. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, OK. So I can see like where people would. OK, got it. The thing about it is that this uh, crypto banking institution, they service many crypto services around the world. Right. Um, Many crypto services use uh, backend processing or B2B tools like this, where they're just the front, they, they're the storefront. But in the end, their banking institution is going to be someone like Crypto Capital, or their actual backend tools are going to be managed by someone like Coinapult and things like that. So, so basically, um, as we are integrated into Crypto Capital, uh, all of these other businesses that also use them for their fiat needs um, would eventually be able to also integrate Dash if they wanted to, right? Like we, we, we get into the ecosystem um, and then from there, it's easier for other people that are using the same services if they wish to at a later date um, to integrate Dash. Um, so that part is important. Going back to your question, um, the other resulting integration that uh, will happen from this is that um, we are going to be integrated into Coinapult, 
And um, Coinapult is a broker, uh, fixed price broker service. And they also offer like directly convertible USD to um, to crypto accounts well, for Bitcoin. And now in the, um, you know, in the short term to medium term, um, they'll be offering Dash too, which means that people that want to um, have Dash and lock it, that's their most famous service, kind of like yeah. locking the price of a Bitcoin. Yep. yep. Um, they, they could lock it into a USD account and then unlock it. So basically move back and forth. Yeah. And with and with Coinapult locks, um, if I lock in the price of my Bitcoin or in the future, my dash to mm -hmm. its dollar value at any given moment, it's not that I can then withdraw that value in dollars. Correct. I can simply lock the price because coinapult themselves will convert my crypto into fiat uh and hold it themselves and then they'll convert it back to me into crypto at any time should i choose to but i can't actually like withdraw fiat from coinapult correct well that that probably wouldn't be their role but you can definitely withdraw a uh, fiat from crypto capital right so you would have your crypto capital account and um you would uh, be able to sell some dash and and have it fund your your crypto capital bank account and potentially also your debit card if you got one. So th the idea, all of this um, layer of services are mm -hmm. eventually going to be integrated to our evolution wallet, which is more of our um, user facing product, right? So. The idea is that eventually we have several partners. We're, we're starting from somewhere. It doesn't mean that these initial partners that are starting with the project will be the only partners that will be part in the future. We're actively looking for uh, more people to join, of course. And as this develops, uh, we'll continue to actively look for more uh, fiat integration, so on and so forth. How will a user interact with the Evolution wallet once it's released? And what does this wallet have to do with these fiat gateways? It is going to allow um, regular people to keep an account. Let's say you want to use Dash as your bank, which is my intention, for example. I want to use Dash as my bank. The Dash um, network as your bank. The yes. Dash okay. network, yes, as, yeah. an, as, a, as a form of decentralized bank in the sense that I save money in Dash, mm -hmm. I run masternodes with the money I'm saving, right? Those masternodes uh, pay me uh, interest or a form of interest for providing this service to the network. Uh, whereas in the fiat work currently, we're seeing negative interest rates, zero interest rates. So, so basically it costs you money to hold your funds with traditional uh, fiat banking. So the way I see it, I want a, a store value with Dash, earn interest, at the same time provide services to the network, actively participate in decisions for this decentralized bank, right? Um, you know, what are we investing on? Um, uh, what direction we're taking? You can actively participate through your votes from the nodes. And then, and then I can have um, my Dash savings, you know, integrated to fiat gateways, um, like the ones we've been discussing and from my evolution wallet i could potentially have uh, a fiat balance you know that that fiat balance obviously is not stored on the dash network it is stored with a particular partner let's say that by that time we have several fiat partners and you choose who you want to store your your fiat um with and then you can kind of manage um your day-to-day -day financials mm -hmm from from this sort of tool so you're and, saying that from within the dash wallet like there will potentially be like like a crypto capital like button or right. like a coin -a -pult button from which i can go in and out of dash and fiat provided i'm say like a registered crypto capital account holder exactly but we're talking from the evolution wallet which the is evolution wallet. web web based it's not it's not the core client that we currently, you know, download and install in our computers. It's, it's, it's more of our user facing product, which is think about the unbanked, for example, you know, um, an unbanked person, what do they need? They need an easy way um, to manage their finances. They could have I am unbanked, Daniel. 
<laughs> okay, great. So you could have uh, a Dash evolution kind of um, online banking, which is, you know, it's not really, but you know, you get the idea, uh, wallet. And then you could have it integrated with this sort of uh, fiat services. And you could have potentially like a debit card. And then hopefully there will be a couple of Dash ATMs in your surroundings. And with that, I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to implementing that for myself, you know, eventually. I have an ATM close by, um, you know, you could get this sort of accounts that we're talking or your evolution wallet and, and kind of manage yourself that way. Um, and evolution will be a web wallet? It would be definitely, yes, uh, um, a decentralized web wallet, which is different. Uh, a decentralized because it, web wallet? Yeah. Um, the way, uh, I mean, it's still in development, um, but the way it would work is that it's based on quorums. So basically, when your wallet makes a call to the network, um, a quorum is formed that's going to respond to the to the request, right? So let's say a quorum of 10 masternodes are going to handle your, your request and things like that. So it's the randomly selected based on the proof of work hashes on the network. So you can never know exactly what quorum is going to be formed ahead of time. So that's yeah, that's kind of how Instanex works. Yeah, but the web hosting itself, there would have to be like central web servers just to like host the wallet, right? Or can master nodes host websites? Well, no. Um, there will all. It would be similar to. Uh, I know you're familiar with our uh, vote inside Dash Whale that's managed by a, a member of the community. Uh, something similar to that, in which definitely kind of like the front. Um, is yeah. is centralized, but yeah. anyone yeah. could create. Actually, there's a few of these sites now. Anyone mm -hmm. can create the user UI front, mm -hmm. but all this information, the votes, everything you're seeing mm -hmm. listed there, uh, it's actually fully decentralized and at the protocol level. They're just reading information from mm -hmm. the network and making it more digestible for people. So something like that. Okay. Um, so with the um with the Lamasu ATM integration using Deginner and the other right. sort of exchange software that you say Deginner is coding, plus the crypto capital sort of bank accounts, plus right. the um, the Coinapult integration, integration for right. the Coinapult locks and all of that. How is all of this being funded from from Dash itself? Are you paying for this, Daniel? Um, no, actually, uh, in Dash we have uh, uh, what we call it's a decentralized uh, self-funding system, where basically um, people vote on different projects to fund, and this is something we do every month. Um, from there, we have uh, two running budgets that are for the core team, uh, meaning. Uh, we've been working with this system for about six months now, and it's been a great experience, but we've also had uh, a lot of challenges, right? One of the challenges we face is that oftentimes um, in, in basic standard business practices, you can be public about a negotiation until you've reached some sort of agreement with the other party, right? You cannot be public about the, about the negotiation. The process. Agreement. Exactly. Right. Yep. Um, one good example of that is, for example, we were able to acquire the dash.org domain. Um, dash.org was not available. It's a very old, valuable domain from 2000, right? It was uh, registered on year 2000, and we, we, we got it. But the problem is that it's such a precious, unique asset that uh, if you go public ahead of time that you're in the process of trying to negotiate and it was very complicated, then you are basically exposing yourselves to your adversaries, competition, different things like that. Someone can start a bidding war just to drive the price up. It's just not standard business practice that you will tell your competition on the world, hey, I'm very, very interested in owning this domain that <laughs> is going to be a great improvement for our project. <laughs> so we discovered that. Um, so in, in, in some of those cases, we've had to 
make upfront payments um, from people that are part of the team or sponsors and things like that, and then look for refunds. Okay. Reimbursements um, to yourselves. Interesting. Right. Um, that's been challenging. Um, another another thing that has been um, challenging is where you're work when you're working with third parties, like in this case where we're you're trying to come to an agreement with different um, partners and things like that, and they're private businesses and you're a decentralized network. So how to do business with third parties and private businesses when you're a decentralized network has been extremely challenging too. And we've had to definitely find like middle ground in that sense. So uh, one thing we've done for those kind of things is that um, we, we're looking into potentially uh, we have like two running budgets right now for the core team one is to compensate the core team the other one is a little bit more open is uh, public awareness it was originally created for advertising promotion and things like that but it's a running budget so those budgets are like the the only core team budgets that uh, pay every month currently and um starting in march we decided that uh, PR and advertising was no longer a priority for the core team. So we're dedicating these funds that we had for that towards creating all this infrastructure and all these fiat gateway tools, right? And Daniel, Daniel, you have yet to tell me where do the funds come from? Where do the funds, where do these budgets come from? Uh, they come from the blockchain. They come from the blockchain, more specifically the <laughs> block reward. Right. Oh, that when you said where, the, when yeah. you said where, um, when you said where they're coming from, I was trying to answer like when in our system, where in oh, our system okay. are the different budget proposals that we have approved. So yeah. I was being maybe too specific as to where where the funds are coming from for the different things, uh, because we have different budgets all the time that are in the system at any given point in time. But yeah, if we're trying to give a more general explanation to users that may not be as familiar with, with the Dash network and the uh, internals of the community, uh, yeah, so we have a system where the funds come from the block rewards, and this is one of the most important aspects of Dash. Um, we believe that we've created a superior incentive model in which the block rewards are distributed for different purposes. One of them is definitely mining, the other one is full node operations, so it's kind of like infrastructure. And the third one is more dynamic, and it's for governance and funding. So basically, all the nodes vote and decide on different projects to fund, whether they're going to fund a specific project or whether they're going to fund a team, like the core team, right? For example, we have a core team uh, payment budget that helps um, pay all the volunteers that are behind Dash that are working on a daily basis, and they get a little token of appreciation. It was last time I remember like 70 Dash or something for those people that are, are full time. So, as you can see, um, 70 Dash like per month, per, per month, pro yeah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. For the people that are part of the of the core team, as you can see, that's definitely not like a full time salary anywhere in the world. Um, but it's a token of appreciation to those people that are volunteering. With so much already in the works, the Dash team didn't possibly have anything else planned, did they? Another thing that, that uh, we learned this six months, another, let's say, challenge or problem we found is that the system was unable to keep contracts, right? Um, because as you can see, um, budget proposals can be voted in, but they can also be voted out. So as the decentralized network, wants to do business with third parties and with private companies that are not decentralized networks. And when you like come to an agreement with them, let's say for a contract that's going to run for six months or some service that's going to run for 12 months, we found ourselves that it's, it's sometimes unpredictable that the nodes may change their mind at the month number seven of a 12 month contract. Mm -hmm. And that's not acceptable in standard business practices. You cannot tell someone you made a contract with that, you know, we, we changed our mind. We're suddenly, we don't want to pay anymore, right? Mm -hmm. You have to keep your responsibilities. That's a basic aspect of business. So in the next version, um, and we faced that challenge, um, you know, and, and that came up 
from this initial experience. It's been only six months. It feels like a lot more time, but it's been only six months since we've, we've been experimenting with this with incredible results. Um, but now in the next version, we're going to be including like um, the possibility of having contracts per se, meaning um, the contract is going to be honored and it's not going to be voted out uh, in the process. So obviously contracts will, will probably have a different threshold for approval, meaning they, they may need more support. Um, so you're going to see that to reach consensus on a contract, which is going to be different than a proposal that you can vote in and vote out, you're going to need a higher threshold of votes, right? So that we're sure that everyone is completely on agreement and ready to enter into a particular contract. Um, things like that, things like that that come up as, as you cannot like foresee every detail or every challenge you're going to have and, and, and things like that come up. So in 12.1, when, when 12.1 comes out, which is going to include some of these new features, we're going to restart um, the budget system, meaning um, this running budgets are no longer going to exist. Um, proposals that are on the system will need to be voted in again, right? Uh, so we start from scratch uh, with these new features. And I think that's going to allow for an opportunity for us to revise based on all of our current experience. So we're very much um, looking forward to that. And now the, the portion of the block reward that's allocated to funding these types of projects is up to 10%. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. If we do a good job and we raise the utility of the network, then there's a higher uh, possibility that the price is going to go up as a result and that that price appreciation is going to be justified in real new utility and value that's being created on the network. Next, I asked what kind of time frame could be expected for these rollouts to be available to users? For this to happen, the first thing that needs to happen is the tool development, right? So um, as this services, as we have ready the wallet integration, the multi-sig, uh, the co-signing, these different things, all these different tools are what this services need to be able to offer Dash to the public because it's what they use for Bitcoin, right? Got it. So they have to and, come in order. Yeah, the, the tools need to happen first. And then mm -hmm. when the tools are ready, then we can go live with the, with the, with the public services, with the integrations. And that's kind of like counterintuitive for a lot of people. Uh, when you're working on, on business development and trying to get more integrations and partnership for Dash, Oftentimes, you start um, in the wrong direction, meaning, for example, at the very beginning, we thought that we should go to merchants and tell merchants that they should take Dash. That's, you know, pretty straightforward. The problem is you cannot go to merchants. You have to go to their payment processors because oftentimes they're not managing um, their own crypto payment process. They're just using some payment processor integration, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you're not in the payment processor, you're not going, it's not going to be as easy for these merchants to take your crypto. Mm -hmm. Same thing with exchanges. People may think all you need to do is go directly to the exchange and tell them, would you support Dash? But many of these exchanges are white label. I mean, they have their own brand. They're handling all of the KYC and all that stuff, right? But for the tools, for the backend tools, they use someone else's service either BitGo or CoinKite, uh, although they're currently winding down their services at the moment, on things like that. So, so when you want to get to the user-facing services, you first have to go to all the backend tool services and get your cryptocurrency integrated to those, or obviously create your own tools that you're going to make available for people that may want to start running services. So I think um, you know, that's what we, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. But the, the positive feedback loop this creates means that you raise utility for the network. Um, you're creating real value. The price may go up. Then you have more funds to invest. Um, but also, it, it also works the other way. If you do a really bad job, the price goes down and then you have less money to spend. And that's good because it means that if you're doing a bad job, you're going to be spending less money. 
if you're doing a good job, you're going to have a bigger budget, you're going to be able to do more. So it kind of self-corrects. And we feel it's a lot better than having like an ICO type budget where you get all the money up front. Because at the beginning is when you have less experience, um, you know less about what you're doing, and you tend to spend too quickly or in the wrong things. In our case, the blockchain is given funding in trickles, right? Uh, it also has a forced transparency to it. Um, you know, even with the challenges we face with, with projects that we can only go for reimbursements, right, and things like that, like the domain, going for the reimbursement makes you go public. So there's a forced transparency. Ideally, before, but in many, in many cases, it has to be after, but immediately after. So there's a constant communication. Not everyone's going to agree. Um, I think the other thing we've learned is that you have to leave some space for disagreement. People see the world in different ways. And in this sort of communities where everyone's, uh, you know, being very vocal and voting and things like that, you're going to have different opinions. Some people are not going to like your decisions. And that's just the way it is. Um, so we've learned that too. Well, um, it sounds like the the functionings of a real decentralized autonomous organization, like a real working machine. That I mean, right. yeah. I would pro. I I normally disagree with the autonomous part, meaning because traditionally autonomous means like it's going to be fully automated, you know, by machines. But in oh, our right, case, without people, right? Without okay, people, right? But I think that's that's I think that's less powerful because people are smart and are important and what you want is to have a decentralized network of people that are in different places around the world so there is it's more censorship resistance right uh, it's more censorship resistant because you don't know who these people are that are voting they're only you know pseudonymous and they're online and you don't know who they are where they are for the most part and, and that creates this sort of independence and um, censorship resistance that uh, really helps the network makes decisions and go in different directions. And in the future, I think at some point, we may even use this sort of network to do like arbitration. You know, you could, you could create a contract and instead of being a smart contract, I mean, it's going to be a smart contract because it's going to have humans behind. And you create like, you can create like a quorum and people can can you know arbitrate and, and make decisions and things like that. So you could create like a quorum of ten nodes, right? And then people can vote and decide on a particular issue. Or then you can create a bigger quorum if you like an appeal, right? You can create then a quorum of one hundred nodes and see what one hundred nodes decide. And then you can go for a full quorum, which would be like a Supreme Court type thing, right? Which with all the nodes, like the budget proposal where all the nodes vote so centralized so, justice well decentralized smart, arbitration decentralized um, arbitration smart contracts that utilizes the value of humans exactly. well daniel that is going down a whole new rabbit hole and i hope very yeah. much to get <laughs> a an update on the status of that if and when that becomes well, a real thing yeah so, that's 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 just kind of like I'm just trying to to um, get get the mind going as to mm -hmm. what's possible. Um, that's you definitely got my mind going. <laughs> it's definitely not something that we're working on on the short term. I think mm -hmm. there's a lot to do first. There's a lot of groundwork to do. Um, you know, we're currently working on the 12.1 uh, um, wallet, the next version of the core client, which comes with with improvements. Then. There's a separate group working on evolution because that's different, right? And then um, now we're, we're, we've been, we're, well, we already started um, this uh, project to build uh, the financial layer of services that should allow to have actual user uh, oriented services. Um, so, yeah, that's more or less uh, what we're up to. Well, thanks for that update. And should people care to stay updated on how these blockchain funded things are going, uh, Dash has a subreddit, yes. And like uh, you, you have a Twitter account or what's a good Twitter account to follow? Um, the, no, the best Twitter account to follow would be at DashPay. 
Um, mm -hmm. That's the official project Twitter account, and it's yes, constantly okay. updated with news and uh, announcements and things like that. So I think that that would be the best one. And you can also visit our forum, which is dash .org, and or our website, which is dash .org, for more information. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Daniel. Thank you, Amanda. Today's episode is brought to you by Black Halo Bit Halo, which is a double deposit escrow client that works with either Bitcoin or Blackcoin. Double deposit escrow creates trading environments where dishonesty could never be profitable for either party. And you can learn more at bithalo.org or blackhalo.info. And that's all, folks. Tweet me your episode ideas or leave them as a comment, either here on YouTube or at the Daily Decrypt subreddit. Talk to you later. The next version of the Dash reference client will support an increased block size from its current cap at 1 megabytes to 2 megabytes. But the interesting part of the story is not the block size increase so much as how it was decided upon and how quickly the decision was made.